Hola, buenas noches. Hello, good evening. Um, it's wonderful to be here tonight uh, under, I'm afraid, um, a very rainy sky. <laughs> um, but this is uh, what we promised, a stargazing uh, event live of the Australian skies. And we are honored to have here with us, here with uh, us. Uh, Angel Lopez Sanchez, Lopez. Professor Angel Lopez Sanchez, uh, also president of SRAP, the Association of Spanish Researchers in Australia and the Pacific. Um, it is wonderful to once again um, put in place an activity to promote science uh, from a SRAP, uh, a SRAP member, and as I said before, SRAP president, um, Professor Angel Lopez Sanchez, uh, a, according uh, to the collaboration uh, from between Instituto Cervantes and uh, SRAP that has been ongoing for several years now. Uh, it is uh, every year we, uh, usu we usually collaborate in mirrored activities. And it goes without saying that during this week, which is the National Week for Science here in Australia, uh, we set or put in place uh, a wonderful activity year after year with SRAP sometimes in Instituto Cervantes premises, other other uh, in other occasions an online activity such as this uh, for today. Um, as I said before, today uh, the uh, goal was to have a, a stargazing event live, and this is what we have. Uh, it, it, is, it is live certainly, but it is a very rainy and cloudy sky. But Professor Angel Lopez, whom we'll be starting, uh, has uh, a lot to show us. Um, from these Australian skies. So without further ado, uh, the most important and interesting event is coming, it will be in, in the hands of uh, Professor Angel Lopez Sanchez. So the floor is yours, Angel. Once again, thank you so much for your time here tonight. Thank you so much once again, Forest Rap, uh, for putting in place another uh, wonderful activity uh, that enhances the collaboration of Instituto Cervantes, in this case in the Sydney and SRAP, to promote science from SRAP. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Coral, for that. Um, I think I'm, I'm honored to, to be here again, to be uh, presenting an astronomy event, which is my passion, as you know. Um, I'm uh, Angel Lopez Sanchez. I'm an associate professor at Macquarie University. I'm currently the president of the Spanish Researcher in Australia Pacific Association. And believe it or not, as uh, the weather is not helping, it has actually been a bit more challenging for me to try to organize this that if it would have been clear. Because my idea for the event was actually to show you live the objects in the sky. So what I'm going to do is to share a presentation and I will try to do a little trick for trying to emulate how we are saving at night. That should be that one. And hopefully you see my presentation right now. I'm going to move myself a little there. So Stargazing Life is covering Australian's winter sky. That was the idea for today for this uh, uh, nice event. As I said, however, we cannot forget that astronomy depends a lot on the weather. And well, that was the photo I took just a couple of hours ago from the place from the place where I was going to put my telescopes to do the stargazing. Here in Sydney, it is an horrible day having raining a lot. So I think that uh, Stitch can say that much better that I can do. Uh, yeah, that is what happens with astronomy, with amateur and professional astronomy too. Sometimes for a professional astronomer that we have to go to a telescope and we only have one or two nights for our research project and only those two nights have been allocated and it is raining or bad weather and you cannot do anything. That is the life of an astronomer, what we are going to do. Anyway, as I said, what I'm going to try for you today, this evening, it is to emulate somehow that. Let me start coming back to the presentation. 
uh, discovering Australian winter sky. Uh, perhaps let me start a little bit more about this image. This image is just a nice image from uh, the Siding Spring Observatory. That is a place where I usually work. Uh, and that is at the Warren Bangor Shire in the Warren Bangor National Park near Kunabarabran, 500 kilometers northwest from, from Sydney. And that is the dome of the big Anglo-Australian telescope and beautiful dark place where we can see many, many stars, uh, the Milky Way, and not only that, but also the dark constellations that the Australian Aboriginal were able to see, particularly the galactic Emu, uh, that is a composed of very different clouds, dark clouds in our Milky Way. So that is when we are lucky enough to have a dark place. If we are in a big city, for example, in Sydney, uh, well, we see stars, not many, but we still can see some few of them. And, um, The question here it is how can we identify the different objects that we see? If I'm telling you, okay, believe it or not, that is uh, there are two planets here and a very famous zodiacal constellation, which is Leo. Because that day, when I took this photo some few years ago, uh, it was actually a planetary con conjunction between these two planets, Mars and Saturn, of a, 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 in the Leo constellation. If I put and add the lines of the constellations, you can see the brightest stars of the Leo constellation and also can mark the two planets, Saturn and Mars. But in any case, if you are starting in astronomy, and that is also part of this presentation, and it was something that in any case I was going to, to say, regardless of the weather, how can we find our way in the stars? What is the best way of actually, if you don't know much about astronomy and how to locate different objects in the sky, go outside and being able to orientate yourself and find your way in the stars? That is one of the questions, one of the topics that we are going to be talking today. The other one will be, okay, we want to observe the sky. We need instruments for observing the sky. For amateur astronomer, or if you are a beginner, I will recommend you start with your naked eye or with small binoculars. But eventually, if you like this hobby or passion, you would like to get a little telescope. And that is the other question. What telescope should we use? What kind of telescope is it best for starting in astronomy? Or what kind of telescopes are there? Let's go to start with that and trying to answer in a little bit to that second question. Let's go to talk about telescopes. I could ask you, what do you think it is the main characteristic of a telescope? And I typically ask this question in many, in many of my talks when I'm talking to the public and try to you know, introduce how we can observe at night and what kind of telescope should be using. And if I ask to you, and if you have been thinking a little bit about this uh, question, perhaps you are considering, hmm, we need a lot of magnification because we want to see objects that are faint, uh, small in the sky. But actually, that is not the main thing of a telescope. The main characteristic of a telescope, it is the size, the size of the lens of the mirror that is used in the telescope. The bigger the telescope, the larger the aperture, the more light it is able to, to capture. Just think about uh, uh, as a bucket. You want to capture the light that is coming, and if you have a small aperture, you will not be able to get many light, but if you have a big one, then you will get much more light. And in astronomy, and that is a big difference with respect to when we are using microscopes for biology or for medicine, in astronomy, we do not use much magnification, usually very low magnification. 
So if you're interested in astronomy and you would like to get a telescope, the last thing that you have to do is go and buy a telescope like this one. Not only because it's, you know, it seems okay, but it's really not for that price because they not only it's a small, but the quality of the lenses will be very bad and the quality of the accessory that we put here, an eyepiece, that will be horrible and will be very difficult to see anything. Imagine that these are classified under, under toys, even though if it is going to be for your kid or it's going to be for a young, a young person. I usually call this kind of telescopes, uh, I'm going to say that in Spanish first, Destroza aficiones or uh, destroy hobbies, destroyer of hobbies, because you will be very frustrated. You will not be able to see almost nothing. Just the moon a little bit, and that it is. There is even a worse case, that one. Um, again, toys, but they are saying 50x and 100x lenses. With that small, no, 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 no. Run away from this. If you really want to get a telescope, get advice. Or you go to a specialized telescope store, and there are some few in, in the main metropolitan uh, areas in, in, Sydney, in Australia, in Sydney, and in Melbourne, and in Brisbane. You can contact them directly, or you, talk, you can talk to uh, associations of amateur astronomers in your area, that they will suggest you the best telescope for you. Because unfortunately, buying a decent telescope that you can start to do some few things is not cheap. Even the smallest telescope that you can use for doing a bit of astronomy and starting really starting in astronomy, there will be at least a 300, 400, 500 Australian dollars. But they will be much, definitely much better than just putting your money in, into, into the rubbish with the 45 or the 90 dollars. Then you have to decide what kind of telescope do you want. And there are different kinds of telescopes. There are actually many different kinds of telescopes, but we can classify them in three different categories. One, it is a standard one that you might think about it. It is a refractor telescope. It is made of lenses, so the refraction of the light. That is a standard telescope you think about. The light is coming from here and you look from the back. That is one kind. The problem with this, it is that they are difficult to get good quality lenses and even much, much difficult to get big apertures. On the other hand, we have reflector telescopes that are the main thing, it is a mirror. The mirror, it is here at the back. Imagine that it is an empty tube. The light is coming from the top, going to the mirror at the bottom, reflecting and going to a little secondary mirror that is just reflecting the light to the eyepiece that you look through there. These are good for starters, for, for, particularly if you, for beginners, particularly if you are in a dark place where you can see, I don't know, thousands of galaxies actually even with this kind of small telescopes. A telescope such as this one, right now it is of the order of the $800, which is okay for a starter. There are some few more sophisticated uh, telescopes, this one, it is called a catadrioptrix because it is combining lenses and mirrors. And I'm not going to bore you about the details of this. Typically, these are much more expensive in some, in some way. But I'm just talking about the tube, the tube, the long tube here, the long tube here, and the compact tube for the catadrioptrix. You also need a mount, the tripod, to put your telescope. Sun can be... Uh, what we call equatorial, so they have actually not two axes, but four axes, because two axes are up and down, up and down, uh, horizontal and uh, left, right, right and left, and the other two are just for tracking the stars. If we orientate this axis to the south celestial pole, but that is much much more difficult to do and you have to learn to do that, and can be also very frustrating at the beginning. That is why I still recommend the kind of alta simutat, which is just up and down. They are not be able to track, you cannot track the sky, although there are some few systems right now that allow us to do that, 
But again, if you have the motor or you have the system, something like this, it will be a bit more expensive. So you have to have all of, the, of those, those things in, in mind. So the setup that I have for tonight, or I will have had for tonight, it is this telescope that I want to, to show you, the different parts of it. Because once that you are into astronomy and you also want to get images and not only look through, but also getting images, then you need a much more complex setup. You don't only need your primary telescope, but you also need a camera, in this case, we will have a cool astronomy camera. We will have the mount, a heavy com mount that is able to track the sky in some way that always the object is always in the same place in the camera, in the chip of the camera. We need a small telescope with a little uh, detector, a guiding camera, in order that we can correct a small variation of the tracking a filter wheel, because in astronomy, typically we use black and white or gray scale, put filters. Um, if the weather can be condensation, then we need some heaters, the two heaters, to avoid that in the lenses, a computer for controlling everything. So it can be quite sophisticated, and it is you know a curve to learn to do that. That would have been one of the telescopes that we have been using today. The other telescope, it is another one that I recommend a lot right now. It is a brand new kind of telescope. It is a robotic telescope. It has always advantages and disadvantages. Right now, this is a small telescope, which is a refractor telescope, a small one, but robotic. I think that the cost right now, it is around $800, $900. But you cannot look through it. You have to use a device to connect to it, and you will get the images through the device. So it's not exactly you are looking through. So it's something different. However, you can do many things even in the cities. And I will show you some few examples. That is the telescope I have here on the back. That is the one also that we will have been using. One telescope for observing one kind of objects, the other telescope meanwhile tracking and looking for the different kind of or different objects. As, as I said, these are brand new. These telescopes uh, were released uh, late last year, and I was lucky enough to be able to get one at the very beginning, and I have been using it extensively, this one, because it's really, really, really uh, good, particularly for beginners. So that is the first part. Now you know more or less what is the telescope, what, what kind of telescope do we have there, but then the other part will be orientating us in the sky. There are many ways of doing that, including apps, and I will show you an app later. I still recommend a lot for beginners just going to skymaps.com, to this website here, and download the monthly map of the sky. In this case, for August 2024, in the, south, um, in the southern hemisphere. That is a very good way of starting. Because in the moment that you have the app, you start zooming and I'm zooming and you don't know well the scales. So I still, perhaps, I don't know if it is because I'm still, you know, old school. And I find, and I still, the experience I have with students, it is that they are able to understand much better how to orientate themselves in the sky using this kind of map. This map, what is it showing? It is all the sky that is visible at... Uh, early August around 8 p.m., late August 7 p.m., so it would have been something like 7.30 p.m. by now for us. With the four cardinal points, north it is up, south it is at the bottom, east at the left, and west at the right. And with this little cross that you see in the center, that is the zenith, that is the point just on top of us. So you can use this for finding the main constellations that are these drawings with the names of the main stars. For example, Artair, Piga, this 
uh, are and the nep is already hidden so this will be two brighter stars more in the center close to the zenith it will be antares in the scorpio so you can use those for orientating in the sky in the back of the page because it is actually a pdf that you can print into into different uh, in, 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 in um, into pages it provides a lot of extra information about celestial objects, tips for observing the night sky, a glossary that we use in astronomy. And in the right hand side, uh, you have actually something that sometimes can be extremely useful if you are starting astronomy. It is knowing what kind of objects are there that you can try to observe with your naked eye, with binoculars or using a telescope. So these are actually very convenient for starting. On top of that, you probably have realized that there is a sky calendar here on the uh, left-hand side. For August 2024, different events, astronomical events that are happening during, uh, during the month. For today or tonight, the 14th, the moon will be near Antares. So I already mentioned Antares, which is the brightest star, red star in the constellation of Scorpio. We will see the moon around there. We will have seen the moon around there. And later in the, in the early morning before sunrise, Mars and Jupiter would have been very close together in the sky, in the, in the morning sky. But we cannot see that. Let me show you at least some few images of what we would have expected to see uh, using these telescopes at the moon. That was an, an image that I took last week for another uh, event that I was organizing uh, using this uh, small telescope that I have in the back. And really, perhaps for starting in astronomy, going to the moon, it is the first thing that you have to do. Even though later, when it is almost full moon, we, we want the moon out of the sky because it is too much light for observing faint objects. At the beginning, you want to go there. You can be lost just finding your place and your craters and your mountains and your terrains and your different features, many features in the moon. You can see absolutely many details, even with a small telescope. Even with the toy telescope, but the toy telescope will be kind of rainbow because they will have very bad quality. Of course, depending on the day of the month that you're observing the moon, you will uh, get different views of, of the moon because of the different phases of the moon. This was actually, this image, it is a mosaic of, well, mosaic, eight different images during the different uh, phases of the moon that uh, my son and me, took uh, some few years ago when he was still in year one. So that was when he was six years old. For him to try to understand better how the moon was moving around, around the earth and how, because of that, that is the consequence that we sometimes see illuminated in one side or the other side. He was later very famous at the school because these images were used for the pocket guide to the moon by uh, the ABC that is still is still there, just celebrating the 50th anniversary of the uh, humans getting to the moon. Um, and he was very happy, you know, to to have his name ported there, so some someone who was able to provide material for this uh, for this uh, website and this pocket guide, and the images were also used for. Uh, in science museums here in Australia and, and in Spain and have been in several books. So that was a good idea for motivating the kid to, to do something else that is a bit using the screens, but in a good way, let's say that way. Of course, you also need a map of the moon if you want to start observing the moon. There are many features and these are only some of the, you know, the brightest of the most famous one, starting with the different Mare, that Mare are just the seas of the moon, regions that are the lower regions of the moon, very different to the highlands of the moon that are very craterized and have plenty of craters. And some of the uh, mountains, the Japanese mountain, the Caucasus, uh, the Sinus Iridium, that means the Bay of the Rainbow in Latin. 
and some of the very bright craters, for example, Copernicus and Tycho. These are two that are very bright, and these will be particularly the ones that would have been able to see this evening. And that is more or less the image of the moon that I would have expected for tonight, with Copernico and Tycho being very evident, this impact crater, recent impact crater, that is why we can see the debris from the collision still going quite far away. And still, let me emphasize that we are using not much magnification here, only 35x or so. With the moon, as it is bright, you can put much more. You can go to 100, even 200x, and you can see only a tiny region of the moon with plenty of detail. It's really fantastic. So that will be the best way of, of starting, perhaps, in, in astronomy and observing uh, our neighboring satellite. OK, so one moment, because we have someone doing funny things. Um, just um, um, sorry for that. Uh, it seems that someone that should not be there was there trying to, you know, to to be messing with the presentation. Okay, let's continue. Um, the other important feature that I would like to show and that you have to recognize in the sky. But you cannot see it, of course, but you will identify this place. And wait, I'm not sharing. Mm. Go back and share again. One sec. That is what I was saying. The other feature that as I was mentioning, it is very important that you identify in the sky, but again, you cannot see it because it is just that dot, dot dash line, which we call the ecliptic, that is the path of the sun as we see from Earth. And you will see that it is crossing interesting constellations that probably you know, Virgo, Libra, Scorpio, Sagittarius, Capricornio, Aquarius. These are the zodiacal constellations. So this is important, not because of astrology, don't make me go into zodiacal signs or whatever. It is important because we are going to find planets around that area on the sky, around the ecliptic. Because all the planets in the solar system move more or less in the same plane. So they're going to be around there. So if you pay a little attention, or you perhaps have realized, there is a planet that is rising from the east at the moment, which is Saturn, the Lord of the Rings. So that will be the main planet that we will be able to observe, not right now, and it will have not be possible for us to observe it right now because it's still very low over the horizon. You need to wait a little bit, two, two three hours at least, to have it high in the sky, and observing much better. But definitely by 9, 9.30 p.m. local time in Sydney, we will have been able to, to observe it. Here it is when I have to give another warning. In the same way that I mentioned that observing the moon is or fantastic, people who are new to astronomy and to observe using telescopes sometimes are very disappointed when they are looking to the planets. Sometimes. Sometimes they are not. They're also very excited. Because we are familiarized, because we are used to these beautiful images taken by the best observatories in the world or for by a spacecraft that have been actually there in those planets and provide a lot of detail. But that is not what you will see with a small telescope. You will see 
the bands of Jupiter with the satellites, and that is actually changing a lot. You will see Saturn and the rings, even the Cassini division between the two main rings. That's kind of black thing in the middle. You will see that. Mars, you will not see much. With a bit of luck, you will realize, I mean, you will see that it is very red, and there is an area which is a little bit white. That is the, po the pole, one of the uh, the north or the south pole. And some brightest, darkest area, depending on whatever you're looking at. So don't expect to, to see very bright planets. I mean, the planets as you see in the, uh, in the photos. Of course, if we are able to get a good equipment and obtaining a photo, even with those telescopes that I was showing you, the telescope, for example, that I, uh, that I showed you before, you can get nice images when you are processing them. And Jupiter, you will see the great red spot and the different layers of the atmosphere. Saturn, different layers also in the atmosphere and the rings, and you will realize that there are actually many rings. These two beautiful images of Jupiter and Saturn and by the uh, amateur astronomer Andy Caselli, who lives here in the Blue Mountains, and he is actually one of the best astrophotographers of planets in the world. And Mars, with a big telescope, then you will be able to see some few more things when the planet is nearby to the Earth. That is not always the case. That is an image that my colleague Adam Jones uh, got at Mercury Observatory a couple of years ago. But this year, if we were able to observe Saturn, we will see that the rings are almost age on. It will be something like this one here, like this image here. Because in the same way that the Earth has seasons, the rest of the planets also do have seasons. And the seasons in Saturn are very peculiar because depending on where the planet is with respect to the sun, we will see very well the rings or we will not see the ring at all. Actually, there is a moment in which they completely disappear. That is the, best, the worst moment to observe Saturn, unfortunately, but anyway. And right now we are moving into the uh, fall equinox 2025, fall equinox for Saturn, not for us, for Saturn. So that will happen in 2025. And that will be the moment in which the, uh, the rings will almost disappear, basically disappear from our perspective, because they're extremely thin. They're really, really thin when you compare to the, to the length of the, of the, of the rings. Okay, what else do we have here? So there is something else that I wanted to quickly show you because perhaps, and particularly as many of you uh, are from a Spanish background and you have heard from people in Spain particularly, but people in the Northern Hemisphere talking about the Perseid meteor shower peaks, the, met the Perseid meteor shower that uh, was a couple of nights ago, the peak of it. And that is the kind of event or, that is difficult to see in the Southern Hemisphere because Perseus is a constellation of the Northern Hemisphere. And it's very famous in the Northern Hemisphere because you can see many meteors in, in just several, several minutes or particularly in an hour. Don't expect to see something like that. I wanted to show you this beautiful image and that was an uh, astronomy picture of the day of NASA just a couple of days ago. Uh, because it is nice, yeah, yeah. You are seeing Stonehenge and many of the meteors of the uh, of the Perseids, but that is combining photos during several hours. Okay, you are not going to see that in the sky. It's very rare, but you will be able to see one shooting star every I don't know, two, three, five, ten minutes. At least you will see something. Something else that you can learn in the sky. Let's move a little bit further into the stars and into the position of one of my favorite positions in the in the southern sky, which is that region here, the Southern Cross, Pointers, and Carina. And that star there, it is Alpha Centauri, which is at 4.4 light years from us. Sometimes it is said that Alpha Centauri is the closest star to the Earth. 
there are two things that are wrong there. First, the closest star to the Earth is the Sun. So it will be the closest star to the Sun is Alpha Centauri, but not quite. That is the, the star that we can see. But actually, there is another very faint star which was discovered in the 20th century, in the beginning of the 20th century, which is a red dwarf star called Proxima Centauri, which is a bit closer to us, 4.2 light years from the Sun. But well, you are seeing stars as they were in the past. Remember that we are seeing the past every time that we are observing astronomy. Gagrux, for example, which is a red giant star, the top one of the constellation of, of the Crocs, which is this one here, that is at 89 light years. That you can compare with Acrux, which is at the bottom of the cross, 322 light years away. And Hadar, which is another super, uh, super, but it is a blue giant, that is located at 390 light years away from us. So that will, that will be a good moment that we can try to do a bit of stargazing. And I'm going to do this only once because I need to swap to um, the iPad in order that I can show you another way that we can use for recognizing things in the sky that is using the app. And there are some few apps, but um, screen, start broadcasting. So hopefully that will be doing very quickly. Um, why? Check. Let's see if now it's working now. There we go. One of my favorite applications and application. Why it is not? I have to repeat. There we go. One of my favorite application, it is uh, a Sky Safari. You can move around very easily and find whatever you want to observe. Remember that I mentioned before that uh, and the moon was going to be very close to Antares. You can see that there. You can actually see also more or less the face of the moon. Um, not they don't have the features identifying the features, but at least you can see how the moon is right now. And this application, this app, I can I can use it to connect to my telescope. That will be the the field of view that we have for that telescope. Um, let me go to the region of the sky that I was mentioning before, Alpha Centauri. See? So I can send the telescope there, if it were clear. That is the little box of the field of view of the telescope. And my surprise for you will, will have been that if we do a little zoom in in here, and we pay attention to this star, it is actually two. It is a double star. These two stars are really similar to the sun, more or less the same size and the same mass, a little bit more massive, and that's that it all, and the same luminosity of the sun, the same temperature of the sun. And with a small telescope, you can see that it is double. There are many double stars in the in the sky. Okay. Let me go out again. Um, so there are many apps 
that you can use. As I said, that is the one that I like, Sky Safari, but you have to pay for that. There is another very good one that is free uh, that is called Stellarium that you can do very similar things. Um, so it's really, really, really nice to, to have also this kind of uh, apps in order that you can learn a bit better where you are in the sky. Let me stop sharing here. Um, and go back to my presentation. Okay. Kind of that stopping the presentation. So that is why I think I will not do that anymore because it is taking a bit too much time. Let me put again the presentation running. Like this. Um, now I can share the screen again. Go. Oh. Okay, and that is an image that I took some few time ago of the double star. It was difficult to actually get that, that image because they are a bit too close together and you need to put a bit more magnification to, to get to see them. But something important that you perhaps are starting to, to realize it is that the stars have colors. They have different kind of colors. And let me tell you a little bit more because it is basic astrophysics. Why is that? Why stars have colors? Remember at the end of the day that we have a star like the sun, 8.3 light minutes away. So what we see in the sun happened 8.3 minutes ago. And the sun, we can compare with the earth, that little point in there, um, around 1.1 million planet earth will fit inside the sun. And in the core of the sun, we have nuclear reactions happening in the way that hydrogen, it is combining together to form helium, the easiest element to the second easiest element in nature. And that is what it's creating a lot of the radiation and the energy of the star. And that is why we see them shining. However, the sun, even though we think it is big, it is not that big. And there are many other stars out there that are not only much bigger or sometimes smaller, different sizes, but also different colors. And in some way, there is a kind of a connection about the different kind of colors and the different sizes of a star. What I'm trying to represent here, it is perhaps one of the most important diagrams that we have used in astronomy for the last century, perhaps a little, a little bit more, that is showing in the horizontal axis the color, blue to the left, yellow more or less in the middle, red to the right, and the brightness in the vertical axis. So the, if you go up, it will be much brighter than these stars that are here more at the bottom, the red dwarf stars. The important point that I wanted to, to point to, to, to show here, and this, as I said, it is a schematics of a very important diagram that we have been using astronomy for a lot of time for understanding not only stars, but galaxies. It is that the color, it is related to the temperature of the star. The, to the temperature of the surface of the star in the way that the blue stars are hot and typically young, and the red stars are cold and relatively they are quite the old stars. That is when I try to make the joke that an astronomer, I'm always confused when I go to open the tab because for me, for an astronomer, blue is hot and red is cold. But anyway, that is a very bad joke, but just for you to realize that when you see the colors of the stars, if you see red, it is a cold star. If you see white, it is an intermediate, not very cold, not, cold, cold, not very hot. And if you see a blue star, that will be a hot star. The first person to actually realize that was Cecilia Baines, that in her PhD test in 1925, she uses the very beginning of the quantum mechanics to explain the different features that we were able to observe in the stars and the colors of the stars and realize because of that, 
that the stars were made of hydrogen and helium. For many of us, that is the real birth of astrophysics, and it was made by a woman that we have to provide the, uh, the, the, the recognition that she deserves, because this has been not well known till only a few years ago. So again, if you see different colors of the stars, you are seeing the different temperature of the stars, and you also know if the star is more or less young or old. Let's go to do something different now. Let's go to this object around here that it seems a star in, in this image, but actually it is the jewel box. It is a star cluster 6,400 light years away from us. So now it is when I'm going to use the other little thing, and I'm going, going at least with this one to simulate using the telescope I have in the back to, to go to the object that we are going to observe. So I this kind of robotic telescope, you can connect it directly to your little devices, your iPad or even with your phone, not to the laptop, unfortunately, unless you have a very complex setup. Compact and easy to move, and automatically it is clever enough to find its own way in the sky with some deferment. So right now it is trying to go there, to try to go to this object. That is what I wanted to be doing actually during the night for you. But unfortunately, we couldn't do that because of the weather. But I can show you or try to reproduce what we will be able to observe. Because this telescope and many of these new devices that we are putting in our in our telescope, in amateur telescopes, they, they are starting to be very clever. And what they do, it is taking short exposures, only a few seconds, in this particular case, 10 seconds, and give you a hint of what it is there. But that is not the end of it. It is not, it is that it will keep taking images and stack them continuously. So that is the jewel box, just 10 seconds. Uh, that was an image that I obtained in, in April, just doing some, uh, some test here from my backyard from the place where we were going to have the telescope. Three minutes. So we have integrated six times three, 18 images to get a much better quality. You start to see, for example, uh, that the background it is much better, that the image is starting to come nicer. But you keep going nine minutes, and you start to see the different color for the stars, 13 minutes. And then you realize that there is something very interesting in this in this star cluster. This star cluster, all the stars have been born to have been born together. They are still relatively young, all of them. That is why the color is majoritarily blue. But perhaps you have already realized that here in the center, there is a red star. That is actually the reason someone put the name of the jewel box because it was the ruby of in, in, in a box of many diamonds or something like that. That is a giant star, a star that has started to evolve into a red giant. And that was particularly very interesting. And you can actually see the colors if you look through a telescope. You can see the difference. It's very difficult to see colors in astronomy, but the contrast in bright stars, if it is a blue star and red star, you will see the difference. You will see that they have different colors. As I said, the jewel box, it is in that area there, and that is an open star cluster, young stars that have been born together and they're part in the Milky Way. Now we go to this object here, which is Omega Centauri. It is not a star. It is a globular cluster. And not only the, a globular cluster, but the largest and brightest or globular cluster that we know in the Milky Way. It is around 17,000 light years away. So we will have been moving also the telescope to that particular cluster. The first image will have not been much, particularly because of the light pollution in this object can be a little bit fuzzy, but we will continue going, integrating, enjoying our time. And 55 minutes later, and that was the image that I took the other day, just uh, yes, eight of eight, so just last week, you can realize that this is a giant ball 
with many stars. Don't try to count them because there are around 10 million stars in this globular cluster. And even we are in the city or we are close to the city or in rural areas, we can actually see this, this object. We can see with a small telescope and we can definitely see with this very small compact telescope. Of course, if you do your right work and you process the image correctly, you will get even much better detail. There are some few other features that we can identify the area, for example, the cold sac nebula, which is the peak of the EMU in the sky, and that is just a cloud of gas. And in that area here, it is another of my favorite objects, which is the Carina Nebula. That was an image that we took of the center of the Carina Nebula with the very bright Eta Carinae star, that star there, that is a very massive star, around 200 times the mass of the sun, that it will probably explode as a hypernova soon. Soon in astronomy is in the next 100,000 years, perhaps even a bit earlier than that, we don't know. But we start to see the nebulosity of this of this object because it is nebula, it is just gas, gas glowing because of the effect of the stars. Again, if we can go and process a bit better the, the data with the telescope that is using my other telescope, we will see much more the details of the gas and the stars. In this image, we see too many stars because that is in the very rich area of the Milky Way. I later processed another set of images just using special filters in order that we can see much better the gas that is there in the, in the nebula which is right amazing. And I'm still amazed that I'm able to do and obtain these kind of images just from my backyard in French's forest, 13 kilometers from the city center in Sydney. There is something else in the sky that I would like to emphasize, particularly in this time of the year, because it is uh, one of the reasons why probably this is the best time of the year for observing the night sky which is this region that you are observing, this blue path that is the Milky Way, that is our galaxy. If we are in a dark place, we will be able to see something like that. That is an image that I obtained uh, a couple of years ago, combining many different images at different angles of the projection of the disk of our Milky Way galaxy into the sky with the bulge, the center of the Milky Way around here. Believe me that it is one of the most magnificent views that you can have in your life, I will say, that you are able to see that in a dark place in Australia at the beginning of the night after sunset and it is dark without moon in, in Australia and in the Southern Hemisphere. If we do a little zoom in on that area, I would like to show you a couple of very nice objects, nebula that are in that area here. Let me show you again. Coming around that area here, you see a couple of nebulosities there. Doing a little bit zoom in, you see the two of them, the, fam the famous Lagoon and Trifid Nebulae. Let's go first to the Lagoon Nebula. Again, plenty of gas. That is a 4,300 light years away from us. All these stars that you see, the young stars around here in blue, have been born recently in the last 10, 20, 30 million years from the gas in this nebula. We will be able to see something like that, but not the colors. If you're looking through, you will for nebula, you will not see the colors. You will see the diffuse gas, some kind of uh, the, the nebulosity. That is why they have that name, the, the nebula. I'm moving the sea star to the Triffid Nebula, again, doing the kind of same trick. At the beginning, we get a very noisy image and actually I have to stop integrating because we had a satellite crossing the field of view that trail it is actually a satellite of the many satellites that we are trying to have out there crossing so that is why now it is a bit outside 12 minutes I start to see the different colors and 20 minutes that you see a bit more so the different in colors in this nebula, it is 
this gas in the red, the red gas, it is glowing by itself. It is a consequence of the very bright star here that is uh, putting light into the nebula. But the a bit more fainter, much more fainter and difficult to see, a uh, reddish, sorry, reddish, bluish, greenish color here. It will be blue because that star doesn't look like, but it's actually blue and it is illuminating the surrounding gas. Perhaps that is a better image to try to explain that, again, using the other telescope, not the robotic one, but the other telescope. If you are using professional telescope, we can know even deeper and obtain even more details. And right now, even amateur astronomers are doing something like that. Very nice. We are almost finishing our travel in the sky for this for this for this evening, but let me show you some few other objects that are not in the Milky Way, are not in our galaxy. We can start with the Magallanic clouds, these two uh, clouds, blue clouds that you see around here. These are actually independent dwarf galaxies around the Milky Way. The large Magadanic cloud, it is located at around 158,000 light years away. The small Magadanic cloud, it is almost 200,000 light years away from us. And they're forming a lot of stars. They have plenty of regions. The most important one, the star forming region 30 Doradus, so the Tarantula Nebula, that is that thing there, that using my telescope, the other telescope, and with a special filter, you would have been able to see something like this, all the glowing gas in there, very disrupted because they have been plenty of supernova explosion. It's a very intense star forming region in the in the in in in, in the Magallanic cloud. If if were at the distance that the Carina Nebula is, it would have been much bigger than the old constellation of Carina. And finally, I can also show you some few galaxies that are even farther away. With this small telescope, we can see hundreds, thousands of galaxies. Some of them are really, really nice. For example, a spiral galaxy N83, that is a 16 million light years away. You will be able to see that kind of fuzzy thing, even if you are in that dark place with an aperture, a telescope like the Dobsonian telescope, the big telescope that I showed you before. Using professional astronomy, we can get even deeper and see well, how these galaxies are made of, what blue stars, meaning young stars, stuff from in regions. The stars in the center are red, meaning they are mainly made of all stars. The black parts of the, of the they are, it is the dust in the gas, in the galaxy, the same way that, the, that I was showing you the EMU the in the Milky Way. That was a face-on galaxy. There are some galaxies, spiral galaxies that are age-on. A famous one, it is the Sombrero Galaxy, and that is again an image of a galaxy, a galaxy that I took from, from here, 28 million light years ago, uh, years away. Of course, using, for example, the Hubble Space Telescope, we will see much better how the disk that is almost age-on of the disk of M104 is. And let me just finish with this image of the Centaurus A galaxy, which is a mix between the two of them, between a spiral and elliptical. Um, that is with the sea stars um, from Kunabarabran, from a dark place, where I was I'm really amazed that I was able, we were able to detect even external parts of the of the galaxy. That is with the the same galaxy was with the other telescope that have much better quality and have been much better processed. Uh, that galaxy is only at 11 mi million light years uh, from the Earth. But at the end of the day, um, what I have tried to show you today, it is that the sky is there for you to discover. You can use a small telescope and really see things that not many people have seen and even discover things out there. But uh, the most important thing at the end for me to emphasize it is that you have to enjoy it. Enjoy observing the night sky because you can learn many, many things or, and also appreciate much better the things that we have here in our planet Earth. And I will leave it there. 
thank you very much for, for attending and I will be very happy to answer the questions that you have. I see Sandra, do you have uh, put your video? So you want to unmute your, yourself, you can say hi, and if you want to ask a question, go for it. Hi. Oh, I don't yeah. like it. Is it possible to um, see a constellation without a telescope? No. Um, yeah, I think that there are two of you talking at the same time. Uh, please let me let me let me mute here. Uh, I'm going to yeah, mute yeah. and and Jamundu. So you were yeah. first. So you want you, you want to ask? Ask now. Jaman. Okay. Yeah. Is it is it possible to see a constellation without a telescope? Actually, the only way of observing constellations is using, sorry, is not using telescopes. Constellations are big areas of the sky that are for our eyes to see. So you cannot see constellation with a telescope. Constellation, at the end of the day, are made up figures that we have identified. Okay, that star with that star with that star. It seems that that is a cross. That might be a cross. But other cultures actually have identified different figures in the stars. There is a game that sometimes I do with students or your age. That is, okay, I'm going to give you um, a sky map without any kind of line. Find your own constellations. And this will be the constellation that you will see by yourself. Officially, by the International Astronomical Union, there are 88 constellation in the sky. So all the sky are divided in these 88 constellations. But you don't need a telescope. You actually, you cannot, you cannot see the constellation with telescope. You have to use your naked eye to recognize them. OK? Thank, Thank you. you. So who is next? Carolina, I think you were next. Me. Hello. Asking you to put uh, activate the, the audio the audio and you want to ask. I want to. Hello. Ah, there, there you are. Hello. How many stars are in the solar system? How many stars in, in the solar system? system? How many stars do you think we have in our solar system? Can you count mm. how many? Uh, no. 2007? No. In the solar system? No, only one, the sun. The sun is the only okay. star of the solar system. We have to oh, distinguish yeah. the, solar system, the solar system from the Milky Way galaxy. The Milky Way galaxy have between 200, two, sorry, 200, 200 billion to 300 billion stars. But nice. that is a completely different thing. The, mil the, uh -huh. the solar system only have one. But for example, the, the, the star that I showed you, Alpha Centauri, that system has uh -huh. not two, three stars, because Proxima Centauri belongs to the stellar system. And there are many uh -huh. stars out there that are actually not one, but two. Thank you. So who is next? I think... There's a question in the, the panel. Yeah, I'm asking, uh, I don't know who are your accounts, maxlabel.com.au. Ah, yes, there is a question in the chat. Uh, uh, is there any website or way to know when it will be a good time to see Aurora Borealis? Okay, Aurora Borealis, um, it is impossible to see from the Southern Hemisphere. Sorry, I'm just messing with you. Um, Aurora Australis is what we see in the Southern Hemisphere. And Aurora Australis in Australia is very difficult to see. Very, very difficult to see. Even though we are right now in a good moment to see auroras. Ah, that would be a kind of a long explanation. The point at the end it is that although 
the closer you are to the poles, to the North Celestial Pole or the South Celestial Pole, the easier it will be for you to see an aurora if that is happening. But the geographic North Pole and the magnetic North Pole are not in the same place. So they're actually not in the poles. They are a little bit in the other side. And for Australia, it is actually a bit farther away, much farther away than being actually in the South Pole. Geography, South Pole. So it is difficult. It can be only possible to see the very bright auroras we had in, I think it was in May, early May, in, in Tasmania, and in the South Coast, very South Coast. Some people, they think they have been able to see from rural New South Wales just a reddish color. But that will be not the very impressive aurora that you that you can see. You go to places like Canada or Iceland or Norway or Finland or some place like that. Their website for checking that, but again, they are the, the best ones are the NASA ones that are that are in, in the, the US because they are not only for America or the Northern Hemisphere, therefore, all the world. Uh, another question. So uh, who, who wants to ask the question? Pazuela Palacios, I have your hand there. Like question. <laughs> yes. Do you know what J4107 me is? Wait a minute. What? Sorry. Say, J4107 me. Me. is J four one is a J four one is a J four one zero seven B is a brown dwarf that has the largest rings in ever. It's about one hundred and twenty million miles wide, and it is true. Mm. It, well, it it can be. There are many uh, brown dwarf out there. Yeah, it's rings have... up to one hundred and twenty. <laughs> but 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 they they they. Uh, they these are objects that are extremely okay. difficult to observe with, even with a small telescope, with these kind of telescopes. They, uh, brown dwarf are the kind of frustrated stars, stars that were not bright enough for containing the nuclear reactions I showed you in the, in the, in the image. And of course, um, remember that there are trillions of objects out there. It is almost impossible to remember the very peculiar and particular or particular ones. But yeah, it can be a very interesting object to uh, to analyze, but not using this kind of techniques. So brown dwarf are impossible to see uh, using small telescopes or using for a, for a, you know a matter. Of I could also have, there's another question I also had. Had to find it. It uh, had it. The name of the star is uh, V one four. Well, um, triple zero Centauri. That's how you find it. known as uh, a J for one hundred seven. Ah, uh, well, that would really be see a, it. That, uh, it would be a faint start, probably to see. Remember that, as really I said, really there are at least mm, there are more than two hundred billion stars in our Milky Way, and many of them, and actually, many of them that are very faint not only far away, but faint, and only using professional telescope, we can see them. The star that we only see in the night sky, the ones that I was showing you, they're relatively very close. They are, and, they're, and they're also the, the brightest. Remember that even I told you, the closest star to the sun, which is Proxima Centauri, a red dwarf star, it is the closest to the solar system, and it was not discovered till the 1920s because it's really, really faint. And, then, and, and they are also the, the brightest. Remember that TV night? Someone, someone have activated. OK, Do uh, if you have any, any more questions, if not, I don't want to bore you with more uh, of my chatting. Again, feeling yeah. a bit bad that, unfortunately, we, we were unlucky with the weather, although I hope in some way, I have been able to show you how we play in astronomy and motivated you to do a little bit of amateur astronomy. I have two more hands, so I'm going to ask 
they have this the last know. questions uh, Yamandu that, if that's okay so that it's not and yes and, and, and you um, too okay go uh, for you it. had um, you had uh, an image that had yes. um two stars that were glowing like a uh, red and blue together i can't remember uh -huh. what the name was does the that mean tripping. it's Yes. yes. Does that mean it's a one is a a young star and an old star next to each other? Because in some way, in in some way it can be, but I think that when you are mentioning it is a jewel box, there is also something that I didn't tell you because then we will start talking a little, a little bit more. Stars, as they evolve, they can change color, and all stars eventually will become red stars because they will inflate, they will convert in a red giant star. And because of that, the temperature in the surface will drop. And that is what is making that they are red. And the way that stars evolve is very interesting because the more massive, the more mass a star has, the quicker it evolves. So when you have a star cluster like the jewel box, that all the stars have been born together, they have more or less the same age. Everyone have been born at the same time. But they have different masses. Some of them are more or less than the sun, the same mass of the sun. Many more will be smaller than the sun. And some few are more, much more massive than the sun. And the most massive of them in that particular cluster is already in the face of going into the red giant. And that is how we see that it is red. In this case, it is not the age. So that is also why they say tend to be or used to be, because when you are comparing these kind of objects that are in the same cluster, they have been born more or less at the same time. What we are seeing, it is the evolution of the stars. And that is also why it was so interesting for astronomers to see an object like this, because you can we can observe different phases of the evolution of the stars, knowing that they are in the same distance, that knowing the distance is very terrific, tricky in astronomy too, and that they have been born together with the same chemical composition, the same age, and the same properties. So that is why it was so interesting to see something like that. And you can see the colors. You can really see the colors. Okay. Um, tenemos una última pregunta de last question, if that's okay, in the chat. And we finish it at that because it's more time than was allocated. Um, but I would like to remind everybody the video will uh, is in in YouTube uh, mm -hmm. uh, at, um, right now uh, in Angel Lopez. Uh, it will also be downloaded for in the SVAP, uh, I think, and also in the Instituto Cervantes YouTube channel. Uh, the last question to wrap it up, if that's okay, uh, for this wonderful presentation would uh, be um, from Gabriel. Uh, he's asking <laughs> what would be the most impactful impactful night sky, the northern or the so southern hemisphere? <laughs> thank you. Thank, thank you for that. Uh, no, what are you doing? No, 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 no. Sorry, uh, my telescope did something funny. Um, it's very, it's very easy for me to answer that question. Definitely the Southern Hemisphere. The Southern Hemisphere is much richer than the Northern Hemisphere because we have the center of the Milky Way and the majority of the Milky Way in our Southern Hemisphere. That is why it is really, really impressive to, to see that in, in, our, in our skies. Yeah. Pues muchas gracias. Thank you so much, Ángel. We combine English and Spanish. <laughs> this has been a wonderful rainy <laughs> sky uh, insight, a wonderful stargazing uh, for adults and for children. Um, and as Ángel says, um, it's about time that we start to um, acknowledge what we have, maybe even looking a bit better or in more detail our sky. So the last uh, few words, if you'd like, Ángel, and we can wrap it up. And I remind everybody that this will be on YouTube channel.
uh, from Afe Lopez, perhaps also Strap, and definitely also in YouTube channel from Instituto Cervantes. Thank you, everybody, for being here tonight with us and admiring the Australian sky. Thank you very much, Coral. I really want to emphasize again that it is great to continue collaborating with the Instituto Cervantes, uh, the SRAP, the Spanish Researchers Australia Pacific Association, and myself uh, uh, personally, in order that we can try to run events like this one and many other kind of activities that we, we have been doing together um, and inviting people to also to participate in next events that we will uh, we'll be organizing. And definitely, if really observing the night sky, it is much easier than what it seems, and is is yeah will be it it will provide a lot of satisfactions. I will say I will say, and so you can enjoy to observing the night sky and discovering objects by yourself. Thank you. Buenas noches. Muchas gracias. Okay. Thank you very much to everybody. Bye-bye.